From the kitchen of the cabin and around the world, this is Voices from the Solitude, a podcast about the coronavirus and gaming. Today I'm talking to UK Games Expo founder Richard Denning. We talk about closing the con and opening it up virtually. So I'm here today with organiser and founder of the UK Games Expo, Richard Denning, and he's also proprietor of Medusa Games. So uh, Richard, thank you very much for giving your time over. That's fine. So I'm glad to be with you. So um, we, we briefly just spoke about this, but this would have been Expo Friday without all of the things that have gone on. How strange is it to be at home right now and not sort of wandering the halls of the NEC? It is. It is very strange. I mean, we, we normally sort of start setting up from the Wednesday of the week. Uh, so we'd have been there for two days by now. Um, and for this year, we were, we were planning to have an extra setup day to allow the bigger exhibitors in and the larger amounts of building to be done on the Wednesday. Uh, so we'd have had two full days of building work would have happened under the plan, plan A, as it were. Um, and last night, of course, well, yesterday, all the exhibitors would have been arriving. We'd have done a show preview. We'd have opened up the bring and buy. We'd have had the, uh, um, you know, we'd have had the press preview, the show, yeah, the show preview, and, and and the first visitors would have been in doing open gaming, and then today, of course, would have been the big opening, and uh, thousands of people would be there right now playing games uh, all over the place. So it's uh, it, is, it is odd because it's the first time, obviously, in uh, in fourteen years that we've not been doing that uh, that event. Um, um, but you know, it is it is what it is this year, isn't it? Uh, you, you know, it's uh, uh, just got to make the best of it and try and uh, come back hopefully next year as well as well as we can. And and has the UK Games Expo become your main profession, or do you do something else? I I, I yes, now I mean I was um, a, a GP, a family doctor. Uh, so that's what I trained as. I went to university, did medicine for 27, whatever it was, years until 2017. Um, and it was the expo was was always, to start with at least, was very much a hobby thing that we did. You know, we just fancied having a go, really, doing an event uh, like a Gen Con, Essence Spiel, that type of thing. Um but th- there wasn't anything on on that sort of large scale in the UK, um, and we felt that there was you know there was an opportunity to to grow something here. So we started it off, but it was always something that we did every year, and then we'd say, "Well, shall we do it again next year?" Um, um, and over the years, it got busier and busier, and we'd always do a lot of it would be done online on Skype conversations. Um, you know, a lot of the the various organisers live a distance apart, so there's lots of online meetings were happening. Um, and then you get to the point that it just takes more and more and more time. And I remember one particular morning that kind of focused the mind that I was doing morning surgery. Uh, and Tony, the other director, phoned me up and said, oh, we've got a problem with one of the sponsor stands we just need to talk about. And I said, well, I, I can't talk right now because uh, a, a lady patient had just walked in and literally collapsed in front of me. Um, and <laughs> was on the floor. And we were sort of running around getting the nurses in, getting the ambulance and all that sort of thing. Um and of course, he was on the phone, and, and uh, so it made me think, okay, this is now becoming difficult to do both, to do both jobs. Um, and of course, it never used to pay much at all. In the first ten years, I I got an iPad out of the show, and I think Tony paid for a gas bill, and that was about it. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't income, you know. But as as it got larger, as it got to the NEC, the workload it became enormous. But finally, it generated income, so we could pay ourselves something not as much as i used to get as a gp but a but a, but a decent you know a decent income that uh, you know kept us going and then over the last two or three years we've added on three other staff part-time um to to help us run the thing um so yes now it's the day job um as opposed to the hobby that it used to be and so you've been through the journey that most of the conventions around the world have been through the initial postponing and then the eventual cancellation so what was the thought behind that process? And then secondly, how hard was it for you to finally say, this year it's it's just not going to happen? Yes. Um, well, we started the journey, I suppose. I remember back in February, I sort of mentioned that, that obviously there was things were happening elsewhere in Italy and places like that. And we was just starting to get the odd preliminary question from overseas exhibitors, particularly people from Asia, China, Korea, that sort of thing. Um, 
in some cases it was more of a practical problem rather than them thinking there was going to be a you know it wasn't at that time people were not thinking there was going to be a worldwide pandemic it was more oh travel is difficult to um, you know i don't think we'll be able to come sort of thing so it's just started to get the initial hints but in fact the the day that we sort of realized that we needed to initially postpone was actually we were at aircon uh, in harrogate and um Tony phoned me up on the Friday. I was up there all, all weekend. Um, and uh, he phoned me and said, I'm going to come up tomorrow and I think we need to just sit down a minute because I think we we'll, we just need to look through this. So he came up and we sat down and we worked through it. And it just became apparent as we started to crunch the numbers and project a few things of the likelihood of, of us being able to run or not run and what would happen if we cancelled at certain times. So if we were to... Make a make a reasonably early call and make provision for a rollover or a sort of postponement. Then the loss would would not be horrendous. If, however, we we left it and we held on to to sort of like last week or something, <laughs> and then said no, it's not happening. Um, at that point, it would have been fairly enormous losses, and that would have basically destroyed the show, um, the viability of it going forward. So that was really the decision point was financially and obviously from a safety point of view, it became increasingly apparent that, you know, you know, large gatherings were just not going to be a safe environment this this year, or at least at that point we thought hopefully for a month or two and hopefully by August we'd be in a position to perhaps run things. But then as as the weeks went by, you know, we, we the, it then became increasingly apparent that large events were really not going to be viable for, for this, this whole year, um, you know, until – we get something around a vaccine or medical or treatment or sufficient immunity or whatever it is, um, that was going to be a problem. So, you know, that was why we ended up then having to, to cancel the August show. I mean, obviously, uh, that's still, you know, over uh, sort of three well, three months away it would have been. Um, and you, you, do, you do think when you're doing that, and we cancelled a few weeks ago now, you know, this is almost four months away. Are we making the right decision here? Um but it became obvious once Origins had already cancelled. Um, we were speaking to the organisers of the larger shows, actually, in a sort of little online group once a fortnight or so. We keep an eye on each, you know, chat with each other to see how things are going. Um, and it was obvious that the other larger shows were also thinking that the time time was coming when it was going to be difficult. And, of course, um, Essence um, um, cancelled a couple of weeks ago, Gen Con. Um, and other other events like Luca, which is a uh, comics and other things, not just games. But, um, they're looking at doing much more of a sort of business to business sort of type of thing, uh, with much less physical contact and much more online. Um, so I think I think whilst we when we made the choice, the larger events only only really Origins had, had cancelled, and so we were thinking, okay, we're we making the right choice here, uh, but then. Fairly soon afterwards, the others started to to do to did the same as well. So I think it became obvious that you know it's just it's just impossible when when, when you're getting briefings from event uh, from the venue the venues about you know minimum safe distances and all this sort of thing and testing temperatures on the way in and things are just are not going to be practical in an environment of you know twenty five thousand plus. Um, it becomes obvious that that type of event is just not going to happen this year. Um, And then adding to that, the exhibitor travel restrictions, um, you know, and international visitors as well, but particularly the, um, you know, quarter of the exhibitors come from outside the UK. um, And that would be obviously impossible for them now to, 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 you know, the chances of getting here would be difficult. Do they then have to to go into quarantine when they get back to their own countries? The whole thing just became apparent that it was impractical. So we just had to make the choice. It was certainly very, very hard, you know, because we would, you know, you hate not doing the thing that you sort of love doing and I've done for 14 years. And, of course, you know that so many thousands of people are going to be disappointed in, in a sense. Although I can't believe we've had, I'm not aware of even a single email or co- comment that says, oh, that was the wrong choice. Like everyone has said, no, it's the right decision, you know albeit disappointing we all we all hoped we'd be able to do something come the end of the summer but i think that's unli- unlikely and and to what degree were you waiting because I, I i spoke to david from tabletop scotland and 
you know, there was there was a sense that they were waiting for the government to say something because if you preempted what the government were going to say, then insurance policies would fall through and, you know, it would end up bankrupting the con. Was that the same case for you? Did you have to wait for the government to say, this happens and so you can't go on? Yeah, I mean, the problem really was at the end of the day was that all these force majeure sort of clauses and things, um, a lot of the time they just don't seem they don't they don't seem to work most of the time. So, so in the case of our insurance, our insurance would cover almost every eventuality apart from a pandemic, um, and a lot of insurance clauses, uh, a lot of insurance um, things that have been issued since SARS and that sort of thing, exclude pandemics, and it's actually quite difficult and expensive to get insurance that would cover it um and i imagine even now now maybe even more impossible going forward um now there was a force majeure contract that if the nec for example wasn't able to to run run the event then with yes we would then get our money back that we paid them but even that was a little bit vague because uh, that would normally cover things like uh, a fire or something, you know, some sort of a uh, um, some sort of uh, major problem with the electrics, that kind of scenario. Not a, a venue which is entirely capable of running the thing, but can't do because of external restrictions. Yeah, so a lot of the time these things don't seem to entirely kick in. But yes, you're right. We were sort of waiting. You you sort of have to wait, but then it became apparent anyway that really what you needed to do was to go and talk to you know the venues and say, okay. The, you're not going to be able to run a thing this year. You're a hospital at the moment. Um, let's let's just make an agreement whereby you know we we reach an agreement for rolling the thing over to next year, um, and, and that then the hotels and the venues were, were happy enough to do that. Um, the only issue was that that meant that of course the money which we paid them was was in their bank account and uh, uh, as a deposit as a payment for next year, and not in our bank account. Um, and then at the same time, we we're saying to exhibitors and visitors, well, we, we will refund you. And we, we are doing, we are refunding everybody. In fact, I think today is the, the day when all of the final refunds for those people who haven't haven't rolled things over to next year um, will go out. So then uh, uh, there's still about 30% of people have left, uh, left their, you know, ticket money in, which is which we're obviously grateful for. And that means they'll have, they'll have prepaid their next year's visit and um, similar scenario with the exhibitors that at least half of them have said look it's okay we'll 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 leave that in as a deposit for next year either partially or fully and that then meant it was possible to to you know get through to next year um you know so and there are all these other things these incentive things aren't there things like the uh, the interest-free loan which we have applied for but it seems to be taking an awful long time to, <laughs> to get so uh um um you know it's um in, in practice, we we sort of had to work our way through as combinations of rolling things over, refunding to those people that wanted it or needed it. You know, we did say to exhibitors, if you're in a in a situation here, you know, we we want you to be with us next year. It's no good as if you go bankrupt to to you know, it's no good to us. So so by all means, have your have your money back, and we and we're now just about to roll out the refunds to the bulk of the exhibitors that need it. Um, we've already done it to a few people that were in a bit of a dire situation, um, and, uh, and then the rest will go out. So, But we sort of had to wait to a point where it was obvious that um, you know, there was enough being money left in, plus hopefully we're going to get this loan that we then could you know, get through to next year, and we're okay. We're, we're sort of, we have a plan, as, 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 as they say, uh, to, reach, to reach 2021. And so... To slightly happier things, then you decided again, like many of the conventions, to take UK Games Expo online. So, so what can people expect from that? Uh, well, we um, are in the process at the moment of converting our website. At the moment, there's just a couple of pages on there uh, that show something of a bit of a tease as to what's happening. But gradually, over the next few weeks, more of the content on the website will convert across to showing what's going to be happening with the virtual side. So. Um, there's been a lot of work on the coding um, of the site to 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 allow that. Uh, we've been obviously having conversations with some of the exhibitors and other platforms that will allow us to to have game demos happening online. Um, 
so now this weekend we're going to be putting a bit more information on the site uh, about what you know the sorts of things that'll be on, um, and also we'll be sending out an exhibitor pack to the exhibitors. Uh, so the exhibitors who had a stand booked for this year, whether or not they rolled over or not, if they had a stand booked this year, we're giving them a sort of free virtual stand. Uh, exhibitors who uh, entirely new ones, um, you know, to us or haven't didn't have a stand this year can 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 book a stand. Um, I think it's 150 pounds or something like that. But that's just a little bit of income just to help, you know, pay for the coding work and things. But uh, all of the exhibitors and we're, and also we're making the visitors entry to the event free, um, so you can get into the show. Uh, there'll be some tickets uh tickets on some events um they're primarily because we find that if you have lots of events that are just zero price events uh like tournaments and things people do have a habit of just booking everything and they're not bothering to turn up and then you make and that makes events not viable whereas if you put just a two pound price on it um people have a habit of wanting to make sure they don't lose their two (laughs) pounds so so that then hopefully means they'll they'll turn up for the event sort of thing and also a little bit of a little bit of income it's probably going to cost 10 to fifteen thousand to run this in terms of the work that we need to do on the coding so we're just looking for a few bits and bobs coming in from that a bit of merchandise sales just to try and help you know pay that um, a little bit um so what people will be able to do? Well, the, there'll be a virtual trade hall. Um, so um, this will be represented sort of you know, graphically by a sort of map that looks a bit like a trade hall in which you can scroll around. But, but it won't be a, like a physical representation of a hall because, of course, that, that doesn't exist as such. Um, so it'll be a fairly randomised layout. But um, you can sort of tap on, tap on stands, but also you can search by exhibitor name, by type of exhibitor, you can do a randomised wand around the hall where you just say, show me a stand, show me another stand randomly, sort of thing. Um, or you can go on a tour. You can pre-choose several stands that you want to visit and wander around them in order. And then when you get to a stand, it will open up and give you uh, information about the exhibitor, what sort of exhibitor they are, links to things that way you can buy their games, but also, more importantly, uh, how they how you can interact with them in some way. So that could be a live Twitch stream that they're sort of demoing on, that you can watch what they're doing. It could be a d- Discord channel where you can hop into and have a chat with them. Um, and um, it might be that they will do uh, that you can talk to them and agree that you'll do a demonstration and they'll then invite you into a um, a demonstration done in various ways that could be arranged. It could be in the Zoom room. It could be uh, they'll invite you onto something like Tabletopia or Board Game Arena and, and run the game, but then be there in with you, talking you through it and uh, and possibly even streaming it. Um, so there's a number of different options around that. To some extent, we're not restricting what the what the exhibitors can do. If they've got uh, options and ideas for how they can show things, providing that can function from effectively a link on our page, just saying, you know, go go here to do this, go here to do that, then they, they can try anything they want. And exhibitors can actually submit events. So they could say, for example, there's going to be a playthrough of the latest, I don't know, Keyforge set, uh, at two o'clock on the uh, fancy fly game, you know, stand or something like that, um, and then you could you wander over there and and it'll link uh, open it up and it'll so you'll be able to search by for events that are coming up and also they'll also appear on the exhibitor stands as well. Um, so alongside that virtual hall, which we hope allows for demonstrations of games and interaction with the exhibitors and talking to the exhibitors uh, either audio or visual or something like that or even just text um, then we'll also have other, other things so we will have a seminar room um, and in fact the, the seminars and similar things are going to be done by uh, twitch channels so we'll probably have three or four twitch channels um, most of which will be operated by on tabletop which are our media partners um, so they'll be running interviews with the exhibitors they'll be doing commentary they'll be uh you know um going around the halls and you know visiting stands and talking to the exhibitors that sort of thing um but also there'll be seminars there which there'll be a full schedule of um and that'll and that you that'll be visually visible on a twitch stream um and then we we are going to run a publisher designer track to some extent which is the 
the area of the show where budding designers can show their games and you know get some feedback. So we're having a look at whether that's fe- whether how possible some form of playtest environment is which we obviously have a big one of of at the show normally so they're having a look at that possibility but we're also we're still going to be doing our speed dating so we'll we'll put the forms back on the site um um, in the next few days so that people who have got a design can submit the pitch for it and they might they'll get invited to a sort of private speed dating session with maybe a dozen or so publishers um and maybe a dozen or so designers that would be the idea um so there'll be a number of activities around that going on. And then we'll look at cosplay and Vikings and the folks like that. So they would probably uh, pop on and do their own, you know, displays. Maybe um, maybe they'll have a gallery of images of people who are getting dressed up on the weekend. Um, the Vikings might do a combat demo. Obviously, it all depends on social distancing. So they, it would depend on how easy that is. It may be one person talking through a combat. It might be... Um, a household of people who could all get dressed up and go into their back garden and uh, demonstrate their sword skills and things. Uh, so there'll be um, um, a certain amount of that going on as well. Um, and then organised play uh, tournaments, we were looking at that through probably the board game arena environment um, where we'll have, we'll have some expo tournaments but ultimately hosted there um, and um, open gaming probably like using them or possibly tabletopia as well might might be a role there and again we'd like to we'd like to have people have the feeling that they're actually at the show so there'll be um you know channels and places where people can gather together so either audio or text channels so we're even going to have a queue because uh, you know, and at a convention, so conventions have queues, uh, so you can go, you can go to the queue uh, and stand around in the queue and just sort of uh, uh, talk about it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So um, I think that's the gist of it. And so, also, you wear a second hat in the gaming world. As a, you're a publisher, um, you you run Medusa Games. How has that been during during the pandemic? Has that affected the the company in any way? Um, yeah, I mean, we would have we were planning to have a release of our new two player expansion of Great Fire. So, Great Fire, my first board game, came out in twenty ten, so it's ten years old now. But it's still still a sort of steady, uh, you know, um, sales with that, and something I think which families tend to engage with because it's one of those everybody knows about the Great Fire, don't they? So, you tend to find when you get families coming around shows and things that they they'll see. Great Fire London, and uh, and it's not it's not uncommon, and they'd quite like to have a game of it. Um, and a question we've been asked increasingly is, can this play with two players? Now, when we first brought the game out ten years ago, it wasn't a question that got asked very often, to be honest. But increasingly, the question: Will it play with two, or even will it play with one? Or will it play solo play? How does that work? Um, has become something that has made it obvious that we needed to do something about that. So we developed uh, over the last couple of years a, a two-player expansion. Um, had it on demo at Aircon and, uh, and you know, took pre-orders and things. And this would have been, obviously, the show where we'd have released it. And, uh, you know, you'd, you'd hopefully get uh, quite a bit of interest in, 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 in something and be running demos of it. Um, but, of course, uh, that's not that's not the, uh, not the case. So um, we will be showing it online at the Virtually Show, in you know, the Virtually Expo. Um, we've got a conversion done in Tabletopia, so we'll be able to run people through demos of the two-player version. Um, and, uh, and I think that's the thing. And, obviously, the big shows are where, as a publisher – you tend to do quite a few sales. Um, you hopefully get your game taken on by distributors, so Asmodee UK distributed to the game shops in the UK, and you hopefully, whenever you make a new release, uh, you know their their buyer will sort of give you an email and say, "We'll take X copies of that, please." Um, and also, the retail shops might might buy from you um, uh, as well directly. But um, the the key thing is often is how well does the games do at Essen and um, and you know Expo as well is it's becoming increasingly important I think for um, for a, a percentage of the sales that publishers will make um, and uh, so having not having that big show there does make a difference and I think a lot of a lot of publishers um, may may find that the lack of exposure to the to the public is going to be a difficult. Uh, for them this year 
um, which is one of the reasons for doing a virtual show because it uh, hopefully allows some possibility for some exposure to the uh, you know um, for the uh, for the exhibitors um, to show their their games. Uh, I suppose the other thing is play is play testing. I mean, uh, conventions are great environments for doing a certain amount of play testing, um, and normally we would expect to have a table showing whatever we're working on. And if you haven't got the convention, then you can't do that, of course. So um, I think that's uh, another area where it will it will impact um, on on publishers. Uh, hopefully, they will all you know, you know we'll all recover from it in time. But uh, it certainly has a, has a, has had an impact. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Richard, for giving over your time. And uh, hopefully, the the virtual convention is great this year. And fingers crossed. It's the only one of its kind going on into the future. Yeah, we, we said when we when we started planning it, is our, our intention is that most of this work is not quite going in the bin, but basically is a one off. Uh, did we did make us think is it worth doing it for one for one show? But we think it's worthwhile doing it, and with there and there may be elements that do find their way through to um, things in the future. But yes, we would very much want to be physically you know, face to face with people. That's one of the things we were saying, you just miss miss saying hello to everybody that you sort of you know, all the, the hundreds of people you get to know in the in the hobby games world. Um, you know, from exhibitors to visitors that have been there since the start and or volunteers, you know, and it's just um uh that's I think the thing we miss and which we're certainly looking forward to getting back to next year, hopefully. If you want to support content like this, you can go to patreon.com forward slash 5G for D. Thank you for listening. Stay safe. And if you can, stay at home.